Thank you. Well, welcome. I, I know that there actually are a couple of people who have just joined us for this last session, so uh, thank you for being with us. Um, do make sure you have, if, if you needed, of course, your, uh, your, your translation device. So, as I say, we are now going to look at the tools and the methodology. How to do it. What to do, but how to do it, what works. Um, a lot here that you can take away with you and uh, work out what to take this into your various parts of the industry. So my guess, if you would just, wouldn't mind just raising your hand as I go along, uh, Jörg Tagger, Head of Unit Social Dialogue at uh, DG Employ. Lovely to have you with us, Jörg. Jakob Mbasha, uh, Policy Officer for Utilities and EWCs at EBSU. There we go, fantastic, sitting on the end there. Uh, Bronner O'Hagan, External Relations Director at Eurogas. There we go. And uh, Sophie Grenade. Uh, senior Policy Advisor at Industrial Europe. So we have EPSU and Industrial back. We also have Eurogas as well and DG Employ. So what we have asked our panellists to do, they've all had access to, uh, to looking at the report, but we've asked them to give us, our, give us their thoughts on this situation and the challenges ahead keeping particularly in mind the tools and the methodology. So I will go along the line, and we're just going to have a few minutes from each of our guests, then I will turn over to you for questions. So, um, York, would you like to start us off talking about social dialogue and uh, what yeah. you think is the way forward? Uh, thank you very much, and thank you uh, for inviting me to this quite timely seminar. Why I say timely? Because yesterday was for us the day. We adopted uh, the social dialogue package, the social dialogue initiative, which took nearly two years of preparation. So it was a follow-up to the uh, decision of the Commission on the action plan on the implementation of the pillar of social rights. Of course, this did not fall out of the sky. Uh, we had, over the last 20 years, more and more initiatives on social dialogue. And in particular, as social dialogue is, of course, a feature of the EU, which also makes us different to other blocks yeah, in the world scene. We believe in the EU on social, in social dialogue. We believe that this is very important for our system of a social market economy. And why this? We discovered, or it was now empiric proven also by the OSCD, ILO, that those member states who have a strong social dialogue system in place are more resilient when there comes a crisis or a transition, recover earlier, yeah, and, then, and then have a more fundamental positive economic uh, uh, performance. This was true with the financial crisis 2008. We noticed it also, of course, with the COVID crisis but also now with the energy and the Ukraine crisis. So in this respect, social dialogue was already high on the agenda under the last president, Juncker, he made his new start, but he also introduced what, was, what is called the European pillar of social rights with 20 principles. And there's this famous principle eight towards member state. You member state, please support social dialogue involve social partners in their policy making, in your policy making, and make, make it possible that there is a social dialogue in their country. And this, this was a, a political direction, but the pillar of social rights was not to be implemented itself. It was a political orientation together with the member states. So it needed now a concrete plan, slicing it into pieces to make it more concrete. This was the pillar action plan, and now we're coming to our package. Why did it take so long? Because some of you know there was an intensive consultation procedure with social partners at cross-industry level, but also at sector level. So also thanks to you, I know there are some from even different sectors here, for your contribution, constructive. I personally read all your contributions, so we really put them together. We hadn't a blueprint before. And this is also when you now look at the press reviews from social partners, they are 
really positive. Yeah? So, in this package, I could now talk for two hours, <laughs> <laughs> but I see your face. <laughs> I will, I will stick to a couple of minutes. <laughs> so what do we have? We have a communication and a recommendation. So why the two? The communication, this is the commission internal business. So how we organize social dialogue, in particular at EU level, together with you. However, this is only us and you at European level. We have no competences to tell member states what they should do nationally. It's just the EU treaty given the competences, but we can make a recommendation. We recommend member states to do some issues, which has not the same force, of course, than a, an EU instrument, but it has some political value if member states commit themselves. So wh what is part now of, or why the Commission communication also now because we know such social dialogue is very important to deal with the coming or already happening challenging also in the transition. And you probably heard from my colleague Frank, we have a lot of transition energy, uh, but also new forms of work. And, and uh, let's say in, in our countries of the EU and our president said this, it has to be a just transition. Nobody should be left behind. And this is very important in order to have also the acceptance yeah, of, uh, of the European citizens. And here social dialogue kicks in to provide balanced solutions. Balanced solutions. So what, does the, uh, what is now concretely? Because we are talking now about concrete tools. So there is a reiteration, of course, of the support of us, the Commission, my unit, for you. But we have additional tool. We will establish in the Commission a so-called network of social dialogue coordinators, so that in each policy area, from internal market grow, uh, uh, internal market agriculture, and all, you don't you don't have to go via us, but you have already somebody uh, to react to. We will also set up a new research network. We are lacking an analytical capacity in the EU. So this will be, we will also want something where we will spend quite a lot of money. We will also focus on implementation of autonomous agreement with more funding, and specifically from our calls. And we will support social partners uh, uh, negotiation in social partners agreement. We, the Commission, want to see more social partner agreement. And therefore, we, will, we have clarified our support. We will not only support administratively with cash for meetings, but also, if you want, when negotiating, we give you advice, preliminary advice, legal advice on the content, if you want. Yeah? And we have introduced also uh, a new visiting program for new social partner, for new not for young social partners, which is also to going to be established. And then there are a lot of other things, like uh, a bit more looking at the structure of sectoral social dialogue, a bit more looking how social dialogue is set up, and of course on the funding, uh, we will keep our social dialogue calls. The ESF Plus, you might have plus, you might have also heard, is uh, also continuing its support. And I will be very short also on the recommendation. So the recommendation is directed toward member states. It's basically on, on a few very important issues. It's the member states have to recognize the importance of social dialogue, and which means in particular involving them in major policy and legal initiatives in the social and employment field. They should also provide the framework for social dialogue. We have many member states, or a few member states, who have great institutions, and we hear, we hear social dialogue is not meaningful. We have some Nordic countries where there's no institutional framework, and social dialogue is exemplary. Yeah? So the number of institutions is not the output of social dialogue. And we ask member states really to provide support for capacity <coughs> for national social partners, in particular in some Member states, like the Eastern European member states, it's very weak 
this has historic circumstances. So with that, uh, I close here. So the day after the adoption is the first day of new work, because we have now to implement all these uh, promises or announcements of the Commission in concrete actions, which will, of course, again be done in close consultation with you. And with regard to the recommendation, we are up to the Council. And we hope the Council uh, keeps the main points alive. Uh, the issue is its unanimity in the Council. So, so we will see how far we got. Well, thank you. Um, if, if, it's, if it's taken on, if it, if it happens, a time scale for that, by the way, how long would that be? Uh, uh, June, the Swedish presidency still would like yeah. to have it uh, under their presidency, so they are very committed, also the minister, to have it adopted, the okay. recommendation. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and if all this goes ahead, what do you think are the most relevant parts for the, for the gas sector? What can people in this room yeah. take away as, as being you know, things coming down the line that, that you hope are coming down the line? Yeah, first of all, even the title of the commendation say it is for, uh, it's for a measure to make a just transition. Yeah, so it is all, the, the very purpose of this whole communication is to help social dialogue to have a just transition. But of course, it reiterates the financial support. So we have several millions where you can also make projects, research projects and so on. We have uh, an increased involvement of social partners in the preparation of EU uh, proposals. We have already, but we will enlarge it now. And of course, this uh, research network, which will be also heavily funded, will also help you and all the sectors with specific emphasis on, on transition in your work, because we know that uh, analytical capacity and analytical work is missing in social dialogue, despite having two institutes. Give me just a real quick example of what that research network, the Institute, could do. What, what, what sort of thing are you expecting to come under its remit? What could it be? For example, we have, just at the moment, 150 social dialogue projects going on. Uh, and we have 70, 80 coming every year. They will look what went well, make best example, make best practices, for other social partners to apply for similar projects. For example, Women in Railways was a very good project. Huh? Why not for other sectors? Yeah? But at the moment, they are all floating around. Yeah? And they will, they will encompass it. Or we give them specific uh, research instructions. Yeah? Look at the effect of the transition could have in sector X, Y, and in the gas sector. Um, let's move, uh, thank you very much, Jörg, thank you. Let's move now to, to EPSU. Um, Jakob, would you like to give us your thoughts, opinions and suggestions when we look at tools and methodology? Yes, uh, with pleasure, thank you. Um, so following on what Jörg explained, um, I would like to speak a bit about uh, kind of framework agreements that social partners can strike on the European level. Um, to speak about why, uh, such a framework agreement uh, can make sense to speak about how we can do that and what uh, we could uh, we could discuss or what we could kind of uh, agree upon in such a framework agreement um, this also has been talked about today a bit today in the morning um, by our respective general secretaries who mentioned a potential framework agreement so I thought uh, it would be good maybe to to elaborate um, a bit on this uh, I think it is important also to, to understand that uh, this is kind of a, a good time for um, a European framework agreement in the gas sector for two reasons. One of which is that the communications of the European uh, Commission, um, like uh, Jörg, Jörg explained, uh, points to the importance of social dialogue and to do more social partner agreements, which uh, always ha hasn't always been the case in the past. And also because, kind of parallel to that, related to this, um, of course, also the background of the adequate minimum wage directive, um, which puts the focus more on the collective bargaining coverage and which asks member states to aim to achieve a goal of 80% of collective bargaining coverage. Um, so this will also be important for emerging sectors, of course, 
and I think um, anything, any agreement that we can we can strike on the European level should always facilitate kind of approaching that aim, which some countries will have reached the 80% collective bargaining, but I also think a lot of countries, probably most countries, will be significantly below that. Um, so this is kind of the background on the EU social dialogue uh, side, such or of course also collective bargaining, together with uh, the energy transition. And here I think what Raluca said this morning is very important, um, that we need to build confidence in, in the workers, uh, which are currently employed in the fossil gas industry, that there are also quality unionized jobs in other in the renewable energy sectors, including, of course, also hydrogen and biomethane for uh, for the uses in um, industry transport or uh, seasonal electricity storage. Um, I think the report report has highlighted what the developments. I mean, it, pro it has projections on what the developments could be, and it has a good methodology on how, from the mapping, we can move towards concrete actions. Uh, this is something that my colleague Sophie will be elaborate upon. And in constant view of what is best uh, for the workers, but of course also for uh, our environment or for consumers in the end. Um, how can we uh, approach such a European framework agreement? We actually have quite strong tools in the treaties, so in the European treaties, there is an article that speaks about Article 155 of the Treaty on the European Union that explains that management of labor can enter into negotiations on agreements, and those agreements can also end up in a directive. So actually there is quite significant room for social partners to really um, embark on uh, meaningful, meaningful negotiations and also to negotiate uh, legally binding outcomes. Um, this is uh, strictly related to labor issues, so this would affect, uh, for instance, health and safety, working conditions, the equality between men and women, uh, information and consultation rights, and more. Um, then the question, what can, could we negotiate in such an agreement? Um, so we have uh, been looking in particular at uh, what can what would make sense in a way to create the framework in the end as I said such a framework should also kind of enable um, the unions on the national on a national level to then um, to empower those unions to negotiate better uh, we could look at for instance training um, individual career building um, gender equality in the sector uh, which I think is something Bruno will talk about um, and yeah, so for us, I think the key is to to make this move for workers towards uh, renewable gases um, a an opportunity. Um, I think also companies have this uh, responsibility vis-a-vis -vis, uh, their workers. Uh, those workers often have spent many years and their labor in those companies. And I think so it's for us kind of what we can do is to create a, a positive framework for those workers to enable the transition, and um, so this is something we're looking forward to to start in the coming months and years. And for this, I believe this report has, uh, has given us a good basis. Jakob, thank you very much. Uh, a couple of really interesting points um, that companies, you're saying, do need to look after would you say look after more those workers who have been there for, for long amounts of time or just be very aware of what they are dealing with or you know, more work needs to go in there? Um, well, I guess it's difficult to generalise. I would imagine sure. different companies would be at different levels in that. Um, but, I mean, I think for us the idea is really that companies, uh, that through our social dialogue we want to create a framework where companies invest in training and upskilling of workers. I mean, I think one example that was mentioned before that I think is actually quite interesting is this NG agreement that was uh, struck also on an international level um, by um, the PSI, industry, which is our global federation, Industrial Global, and the International Builders and Woodworkers, and that kind of um, sets a framework for NG to say we will invest um, I don't have the exact numbers in my head, um, into an X amount into training. We will also make sure that 
mobility will be facilitated where it is necessary and more. Uh, so I think this is something concrete we could actually draw inspiration from and this is something that other companies should ideally do as well. Uh, and something else you, you mentioned, um, one of the first things you said, you have to build confidence in those workers, which I thought was really interesting because you know, a company does need to build up the confidence in its workers because then you have workers who are likely to be far more positive and, and start embracing other possibilities. You can, you can only hope. Naturally, yeah, of yeah. course. And I think that also goes back to something we said before, that it is, in the end, it's also important to take a broader view. Yeah. Um, so we, uh, our, our union federations, EPSO, but also industrial, would organize our affiliated unions would organize in the gas sector, but also in other sectors like electricity. And as we discussed about before, kind of there are tools that are transferable. So ultimately, this will also be important to look to take this kind of panoramic view. Thank you. Um, Brona, do you want to come in there? Um, Jakob said that you are no doubt going to talk more about training, but uh, I will leave the floor to you. Yeah, and uh, uh, gender, indeed. Uh, I'm going to, going to get to that point, certainly, Sasha. Uh, I have to start, though, by saying thanks, because I'm afraid I'm going to forget at the end. So um, uh, in terms of support for the project and, of course, to Syndex, because um, uh, for us, it's really a, a wonderful starting point. And, and while we've worked closely together the last two years, it, it is, we all know, a starting point and there's um, plenty to do on the road ahead. Um, but a great, solid basis, I must say. Um, the team at Eurogas feel that we have learned really a huge amount from this undertaking. Um, it's been incredibly insightful to have this immersion into the social issues and work um, with, with Sophie and Jakob uh, in this way. Um, now what we have to do is take that to the next level. So I'm going to take the opportunity of having a platform this afternoon um, to send a call out to our members. Um, to Eurogas members, we are launching a new task force, as you're probably aware. Um, this has been put uh, in place uh, from the board before Christmas, and we need as many parts of the value chain and as many parts of the business actually represented there, because what we need to do is look at the recommendations from this report and see what we can um, put in place, where and how, and how to do it properly with the ultimate objective of a very fast, just transition. Um, so more to follow from me and my colleague Martina Bassan on that one uh, as we go into 2023 now. Um, I, can't, I can't speak really you know, on behalf of the membership at this point in terms of the recommendations. Uh, I would be very surprised, I must say, um, if, if anyone objected to the general direction of the report. I think uh, it seems like quite a sensible framework in terms of scaling hydrogen, biomethane, carbon capture storage to ultimately decarbonize the gas network. Um, and of course, quality social di dialogue is one of the core recommendations, is something that we already support at Eurogas and we're keen to do more on and progress on. Um, there, there are best practice examples uh, in there, and uh, from my perspective, um, with responsibility for comms at Eurogas, I think it's worth noting that when we put those best practice examples out there, we're not interested in giving ourselves a pat on the back. <laughs> um, it's about sharing best practice and inspiring others to do the same. Um, so when you see that in our comms, it's to that end um, to replicate where things are, are going properly and and repeat them uh, across different countries um, and different parts of the value chain as well. Um, it's clear from the report and from the conversation today, we all know very well the context that we're in right now. Uh, it's serious. It's one of great disruption in terms of climate emergency, in terms of the war, the ripple effects that that's happened on consumers, on um, uh, industries as well, and businesses across Europe. It's a serious time. Um, logically, we're at the beginning of a, of a journey also in terms of decarbonizing the networks and the beginning of a, a time of disruption. Um, and it does make me think on the point of gender. Um, in the war, you saw women go into factories and take up work there. Uh, to keep things taken over, and it's I have this feeling that it has to be you know the collective effort where things change and and people do things in a different way. Obviously, this time women will stay in those roles. Uh, they'll they'll continue to hold those posts, and what that means for the sector is that. Uh, it, it is a cultural change. So we're at the start of a cultural change. 
um, and it's not the most straightforward topic. Um, there is a good uh, recognition from Syndex in the report of the theme of intersectionality, and I, I, I'm really pleased to see that there. I think it's something that can be a bit neglected uh, in um, Brussels in general, in, in energy and beyond. Um, intersectionality, for anybody who doesn't know, is uh, where any single person can experience two or more kinds of discrimination. And the implications of this are that when we try to address inclusion and fill in the skills gap in the sector, we can't just think about the gender pay gap. We also have to think about how other aspects of discrimination um, could affect somebody's uh, progression in their career. So this could be ableism, it could be um, racism, classism, homophobia, transphobia, you know, I can go on. Um, but what we see in the report and the recommendations which apply to a lot of the different problems are very sensible solutions. Uh, so, so to begin with, you know, like having quality social dialogue and hearing from the different parts of, uh, of the community and the business and indeed bringing the new talent into the business, uh, like was mentioned um, in, the last, in the last panel. Um, we can, and I must say, I'm, I'm really not an expert on this, um, but there's work to be done in terms of the language that's used and how language is inclusive and promotes inclusivity and makes people feel welcome into workplaces and in their jobs. And that applies also at the stage of recruitment. Um, similarly, um, uh, working with the, the national level with education facilities and with training institutes to address these issues as well. Um, um, even um, the idea to bring um, diversity and inclusion in this kind of best practice or, or good manners, whatever way you want to think about it, into performance reviews. Uh, so there's all kinds of um, ways that this could be addressed and, and should be addressed to fill the skills gap use, leverage the way that diversity and inclusion does um, benefit innovation and, and, and the way that we think and deliver climate solutions. Um, and while I, while I did say that there isn't enough focus on it in Brussels, there's a, a wonderful initiative from the Florence School of Regulation who are, uh, I think, one of the, the first movers on this really. Um, and I know that that's supported by Land Pharma and Edison as well. Uh, and what they're doing is offering a networking hub and um, uh, even scholarships and communications around these issues of um, an intersectional approach to gender inclusion. Um, so things are happening. Um, uh, there's a lot to do. Um, those are my, my first thoughts on the report, but I'm sure we'll come back with questions <laughs> on the Absolutely. various points. Absolutely. I mean, the and everything you were talking about doesn't just make good social sense, it makes good business exactly. sense as well. Mm -hmm. um, we'll take questions at the end, but we just need to hear from Sophie as well. So we've heard from EBSO, let's hear from Industrial. Your, your thoughts on the tools and the methodology in the report. Yeah, of course. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, of course, it's not an easy task to be the last speaker of the last panel, so I will try to be uh, short and also very concrete so you can uh, keep your attention so yeah, the, the title of this, uh, this uh, panel is um, uh, aiming to, uh, to develop maybe the tools and the methodology of the society dialogue. Maybe it's not uh, very um, uh, in the mind of everyone here, so I will maybe recall a bit the different tools that we, we have at our disposal when we talk about society dialogue. Because society dialogue is not just talking, uh, it's also uh, trying to have agreement in the companies, etc. So that's important maybe to recall a bit the frame. So uh, Jörg has explained uh, before, um, before me the, the, the review of the society dialogue at the EU level. This is very much important because here we are also all working with a different EU institution and we, we we will now have some uh, um, society dialogue coordinator uh, in, the, in the review. We have this, uh, this proposal, which is very much important because this means that we, as social partners at the European level, we will be in touch with the different DG inside the European Commission, also trying to, uh, to advocate in our sense, in the, also with DG Energy, DG Environment, etc. because we used to work a lot with DG Emploi, but now we will also have other, other place to, uh, to express our, our problem, but also 
um, uh, provide some solution to, the, to different challenges. So this is the European uh, Society Dialogue framework, if I may say. Then we have also the Society Dialogue on the European le level, but for, so for the sector. So we have, for example, this Sectoral Society Dialogue Committee for the gas sector. Uh, we already mentioned it, and lots of you already know that. Very much important, because we have there an area in which we can discuss uh, about the different challenges of the sector, not only social challenges, but also so more uh, general uh, challenges linked to the energy transition, etc. This is also um, uh, because of this uh, sectoral society dialogue committee that we can we have launched this project with the support of the European Commission, who has financed this project. So it's very much important, and we have also the opportunity in this kind of, of uh, sectoral society dialogue to negotiate agreement. And Jacob has expressed uh, the, the the project that we have to maybe go a step further. In, uh, in the discussion, not just discuss or even joint statement, but really engage into an agreement which will be binding for all our members. So that, that's very much important. And maybe uh, not just our members, but if we uh, achieve to have it into a directive that will apply to all companies. So that's very much important. And that's why we would like to take the time to, uh, to discuss the different uh, uh, challenges that we uh, would like to see uh, solved in this uh, uh, EU framework agreement. So that's about the EU level. Of course, we have also society dialogue at the national level and at the company level. And uh, I think that's what's also like in the, at the heart of the report of Sandex, it's super much important to uh, focus also on collective bargaining because it's nice to have place in which you can discuss between the trade union and the employers, but uh, uh, sometimes you, you have to go further, not just about uh, being uh, listened, etc., but you, you have to, to sign agreement uh, on different topics. And I will maybe uh, give you some uh, concrete example. Informing, uh, consulting, and also having the participation of workers at the different level are, are very much important for us. Because, you know, for the gas sector, we are talking here about 2,020 workers, more or less. Uh, that's huge. Uh, they will see, uh, we have heard that uh, since this morning, lots of transformation uh, in their companies, in their tasks, in the skills that will be needed, but also transformation of their working conditions. So that's very much important that we still uh, go forward, but all together, uh, leaving no one behind. Uh, because that was also a question that, Sasha, you, you asked uh, in the morning session. Okay, but sometimes we have to go fast. Why uh, will we have the time to, uh, to, to maybe have this social dialogue? But uh, I think that it's clear, and Anna said that also, we do not have the choice. Because if we do not manage to have everyone on board, and social dialogue help to have everyone on board, then you will miss the train, and we will miss the social train. We already see that there is a, a big social crisis, uh, but then we will also miss the train of the energy transition, because you will not have with you the citizens. They will see that the energy transition, the green transition, uh, is going to, to maybe left some uh, community behind, so they will not uh, go with you in this important, uh, in this important transition. So that's, I think that's why also, uh, it's very much important to focus all our attention on these uh, different tools. Okay, so that was already said. The report of Sandex uh, have, um, have shown how much uh, society dialogue is important at a different level. But this is also important to say that the, the, the social partners, the trade unions and the employers, when they talk together, they are really the, the best person that has a better place better than everyone to, to know how this should happen because they know the work that has to be done, they know the challenges of the company and when they are together they are really the best place to, uh, to discuss this. Maybe uh, quickly uh, I can also try to give you some concrete input regarding the different recommendations of the report and how we can translate that into a, into a society dialogue. First recommendation was about having a, a comprehensive methodology uh, by mapping scenario, mapping the, the jobs need and skills needs, etc. Okay, that's great to, to, to see that we, we can go forward with that, but having really just transition plans 
uh, with the different stakeholders, trade union and employers is absolutely, need, absolutely needed. Uh, we had a project in the electricity sector related to skills, which was very much important because we have discovered that uh, it was very difficult to anticipate the skills need because there was no area in which the different key stakeholders were able to speak together and define the right skills. So we had this uh, excellent project, Skills to Power, uh, in different countries in which we tried to put together the different uh, stakeholders, so uh, VIT providers, uh, trade unions, employers, in trying to define together the, uh, the, the, method, the, the, the way in which we can uh, improve the, the, the skills of the workers and try to, to, to fill in a bit the, the skills gap that is, uh, uh, currently, uh, that is a, a current challenge of the electricity sector. So very much important. The second recommendation of Sandex was about promoting uh, training. Uh, I think that was very clear in the last panel. This is absolutely key. We already know that uh, very well. And once again, involving the workers, the trade union representative in defining the, the right trainings helps also to, uh, to, to face uh, uh, these uh, huge challenges. Um, maybe I would like also to, to focus on the, the attractiveness um, and the, this uh, fourth recommendation of Sandex uh, because we have heard that uh, it's also a huge challenge for the gas sector to still be attractive. But for us, it's also absolutely key, uh, absolutely key link sorry, to the uh, uh, society dialogue because when you have a good society dialogue at the company level, you have better working conditions, better salaries, better uh, trainings, opportunity, etc. So it helps also to attract people because then you have good good jobs in a in a sector which is uh, um, proposing some some discussion with trade union, etc. So that's also uh, very much important. Um, trying to be uh, concrete, I can also uh, uh, share with you two uh, demands that we had as Industrial Europe. We, you know we have launched last year the Just Transition Manifesto, in which we try also to develop some key uh, proposal linked to, uh, to, um, to Just Transition, of course. And there I would like to point two of them, linked to what was discussed uh, uh, all the day. Uh, we think that, as an example, we should have a mandatory Just Transition plan in each company. Just uh, j mandatory just transition plan get, that can of course be discussed with the different stakeholders, the full involvement of the workers' representative uh, that could help also to uh, maybe uh, define the, the way in which the company should should go regarding just transition. Also, another solution that we would like uh, to, uh, to, to propose is having specific mandates uh, for just, just transition shop stewards. So at the company level, having shop stewards who um, have this specific mandate of following just transition uh, within the company, uh, a, a bit equivalent to what we have on, uh, regarding health and safety representatives. So uh, they can also benefit from, from the right training and try to be involved in the corporate transition planning. I think that could be uh, uh, very much important. Um, I had lots of other examples regarding uh, uh, agreement that were uh, bargained at the company level. I will not be too long. I just want maybe to, to finish by also tackling one thing that we have not um, uh, discussed a lot today is about uh, the young people and uh, how we can also uh, have uh, more uh, involve them more in our in our company, etc. Uh, and it's very much important to to mention that in countries with in with a, a very well functioning uh, society dialogue and good collective bargaining uh, coverage, young people sometimes have better access to quality apprenticeship and jobs. So that's very much important once again to have uh, a good uh, collective bargaining structure. Uh, in France, for example, in the, in the metal sector, social partners have signed some, uh, a branch agreement that encourages uh, the, the hiring of young people to uh, a solidarity system. Um, uh, this means that every two departures, they, uh, in, uh, they are hiring uh, one young people which is trained uh, in, uh, with um, uh, a good uh, support of the of the company to have the right skills, etc. So, we we see that uh, there is some uh, some way to um, to encourage also uh, better involvement of the young in the in the in the workplace, if I may say. So yeah, still a lot to do, but some concrete example uh, that uh, 
I have shared with you. Lots, I would say. <laughs> Sophie, thank you. There was, uh, there was so much there. Um, I, I, let's just hone in on, on, on one. Each company having a mandated plan. Do, do you think that is feasible when we look at the, the number of small and very small companies within the sector? And then I'm going to ask Brody yeah. what she thinks. For, for us, it's, it's uh, yeah, absolutely. It would be very important and key. And this will also help the SMEs and the lit, little company to go forward. Because if they, they do not have a plan, then at one point they will, they will fail. Uh, and if they, they anticipate better the changes of the sector, the changes of the workforce, and the skills needs, etc. It will also help them to go towards this just transition. So, I would say it's 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 up to to each company to uh, to find the the best way to organize that. But it will also help them, not just the workers, but the company uh, as such. Yeah. I mean, Brona, I know you can't speak on behalf of, of of the membership. You are now in the stage of is it this afternoon? You say that you're sending out the task force request in the coming days. Coming days. Okay. <laughs> what? Where's your head at in, in this thing when you listen to Sophie? I'm sure we won't, we won't rule it out. I think that's a really interesting idea. And we spoke earlier today as well about how information is shared across mm -hmm. sectors. So depending on how we structure these efforts going forward, if that's in an EU framework agreement, these are the kinds of tools absolutely that we can consider. What, what would that entail? Who should be involved in the information gathering? How can it be shared across companies, across sectors? Um, because the, the shared interest is uh, emissions reductions for the planet that we all live on uh, and and of course you know like to keep the um, the businesses um, well staffed and, and, and equipped to, to roll out the solutions mm. should we take some questions from the floor would anybody like to come up with a, um, a any sort of specific thoughts or, or queries on anything that they have heard no, it doesn't look like it. There's a lot of information there. So I will just um, end this panel by asking all of you, just in a, in, in a sentence, if, if, if I might, and take a moment to think about this. When we talk about everything we just have done over the last, what, 45 minutes or so, about how to get to a just transition so that with that social dialogue um, and thinking of our communities first and foremost... What's going to be the hardest thing to get right or to put into practice? And actually, you, you can say anything that maybe you've heard today as well. Sophie is thinking, oh, it's going to be all of them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Jacob, would you like to start? The hardest thing to put into practice, do you think? Um, I think for trade unions, the priority would probably be to organize kind of newly emerging sectors well. We have, for instance, examples where this is not the case, one of which, I mean, when, I, when I'm just thinking spontaneous law, for instance, Tesla, which comes to build electric cars, let's say, for the top 10%, but they have been quite notorious for their anti-union behavior, certainly in Germany. So I think for unions, the challenge would be to make sure that newly emerging sectors are uh, well unionized with a strong worker's voice to make sure that those jobs are, are quality. Okay. Um, Sophie? Yeah, fully agree with what Jacob has said. But also maybe I would, to reply to your question, I would say maybe uh, the willingness of the, the, the employer side also to negotiate agreement because uh, that was also mentioned today. Eh? If, we are, if we are just a trade union in front of, of uh, uh, employers who, want, who do not want to, to agree and having strong agreement, then we will lose uh, this train again. Mm. Um, Brona, there are obviously lots of great examples of things already. We mustn't lose sight of the fact that there is already lots of best practice, people doing really well, organisations doing really well. But what do you think will be the trickiest thing going forward? Mm, I, I think I touched on it from the floor earlier today. Um, we, we do need to gather and share this information. And Yorgas absolutely supports quality social dialogue. There are challenges in terms of the information that we can gather and share. So so be it for HR, GDPR reasons, um, what affects share prices of companies. But uh, I said it earlier and I'll say it again, we mustn't have the attitude that it's an insurmountable task. That's It's rather that we use social dialogue to understand the ways that we can overcome hurdles like that. Mm -hmm. mm. That's a very good point. Um, and finally, Jörg, the, the trickiest thing. So 
the trickiest thing, and this is of course not only for the gas sector, is that we see uh, good agreements between social partners, and not only formal agreements, but it can also be another output, which is above the just minimum standard which can be reached. Sophie is nodding, so, <laughs> and so is Jakob. Okay, so pushing further, going further. Okay, um, it's been really interesting to hear your thoughts and your opinions on the tools and methodology needed already in place or that you would like to see as we move forward with this. So thank you very much for joining us for our final panel today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think what would be really quite nice if we um, just wrap up everything that you have heard today, because goodness me, there is a lot that we have got through. So, um, if I could ask you to... There we go, lovely. Thank you. Um, uh, let's bring back um, for a final chat and just go through everything they've heard. Uh, let's bring back to the stage uh, Judith Curtin, darling, from Industrial Europe. Uh, Matthew Lay is going to join us from EPSU and James Watson from Eurogas. The tree. If you would like to come and join us. Thanks very much, Jörg. Do you want to go in the middle this time? I'll come around this side. Thank you. Now, I don't know whether you have lots of notes pre-prepared or you've just got lots of scribbled ideas. What would you, how would you like to do this? Judith, would you want to go first? Um, yeah, I'm happy to. Um, I, uh, I didn't realise, for a start, I didn't realise that my mic was on. So uh, you may have heard me say to Brona uh, that she should switch sides and join the uh, trade union movement because... Uh, I think there were some really interesting points which were raised um, in the last panel. Um, I think today, what has I'm what it's going to say? You should see James's face then, but uh. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we need a, if, and we definitely need her if we're going to keep this dialogue moving uh, forward. We fair need enough. people like we will, on our will, side too. We, uh, we won't pinch people in yeah, the context yeah, of sorry. a conference. Then no bother. <laughs> um, I guess uh, from from my side of listening to the um, debate from the morning until now, um, some conclusions were that I, I think it was interesting that there seemed to be broad consensus around the recommendations uh, that have been developed in the report. We can see in the report that we have some really major um, data gaps and, um, and a really big issue with actually mapping what's going on on the ground across Europe. Um, and uh, two points on that. One, um, separately uh, to this work with Eurogas within industrial Europe, and Sophie mentioned our Just Transition uh, manifesto, which was launched in May last year. One of the demands within that Just Transition manifesto was the creation of a European observatory on just transition, where there would actually be a responsibility uh, for the European institutions, together with member states, together with regions, employers, unions, uh, to create that mapping of the impact in the, in the, um, the world of work um, in different sectors. And I think in some ways it's not part of the recommendations, but the, the the recommendations and the findings from this report support that demand uh, that we've been making um, towards the the European Commission. And actually, in the sometimes in conferences, the conversations in the corridors are as interesting as the conversations um, coming in the main room. And it was interesting this morning that uh, we got confirmation from DG Employment that there is a process starting within the Commission to work out how to establish such an observatory at European level. So I would hope that the study that we've done collectively um, in the gas sector would then be another tool that we can bring to the table in the discussion with different parts of the Commission to try and really flesh out this European uh, policy around just transition, which, which goes beyond uh, the gas sector. In terms of the gas sector, I think one of my other um, uh, very strong conclusions uh, from the discussion today, but also from the workshop that we had um, last year, 
were, is this uh, slight paradox, well, it's a big paradox that we have, that um, we have a, a sector which is at a crossroads, uh, you said it this morning, um, but, and, we ha and there's a perception that this is maybe one of the sunset industries in Europe, when at the same time, there is an enormous transformation of the industry on the horizon. And today, we are struggling to find workers for the industry as it stands, as it is. Never mind the thousands of workers which will be needed if we're to achieve the ambitions um, which are set out in Repower EU as part of the Green Deal um, and so on. So for me, there's this, uh, this challenge that we face around labour shortages and, and missing um, workforce, which, is, which we really should amplify more in the, in the public debate. And, um, and therefore, I think it's interesting to look at what's going on around Europe beyond gas, if you like. Not beyond gas as in after the gas sector, but beyond gas as in other industries and cross-sectorally. And, um, and there's maybe some inspiration from the national level in countries like Austria, in Sweden, now in Germany, where um, the idea of a just transition training leave is starting to be developed at national level. In Sweden, there is a collective agreement which has created the opportunity for workers to take a year's training leave to upskill and reskill in the context of the changing economy. We heard an announcement from Germany this week that they are following a similar path. We have a similar initiative in Austria, which the Germans are hoping to, to mirror. So there are some ideas already on the ground um, which we can inspire ourselves as we look at how we take these recommendations forward uh, towards uh, a negotiation. And beyond Europe, there are some really interesting develops and developments at the moment. Nobody has mentioned today the Inflation Reduction Act, um, but I left the meeting um, at lunchtime, uh, so I apologise to colleagues who were in the best practices panel. I missed it because I had to go to the Berlimont building uh, to meet Vice President, Executive Vice President Dombrovskis to talk about the Inflation Reduction Act and to talk about the social conditionalities which are included in the promotion of the clean gas infrastructure and industry in the US. The Inflation Reduction Act has set out an enormous package of industrial support for hydrogen, for CCUS, for um, the transformation and development of clean gas infrastructure. But it's not a tap that turns on without conditions. Linked to that um, uh, subsidy program, companies have to comply with collective bargaining agreements as related to wage agreements, prevailing wage agreements. They have to comply with apprenticeship um, criteria, including that for if you want to benefit from these uh, tax credits, you have to show that 15% of the work has been done by apprentices who've been brought into the company. Now, if we're thinking about how we deal with um, the labour shortages that we have in Europe that we've been talking about this morning, shortages of blue-collar jobs, welders, skilled blue-collar jobs, welders, electricians, and so on, but also white-collar jobs in terms of more IT skills, more um, engineers coming into the sector, then what an opportunity for Europe through the, the response to the Inflation Reduction Act that von der Leyen has put on the table in this net zero industry package to tie that to the similar kinds of social conditionalities around apprenticeships, around the quality of work, around training opportunities um, to transform the European economy. And I think we, within the gas sector, we've already started some of these conversations. We're maybe ahead of the game in comparison to some of the other industries in Europe. And I'm really hopeful that, um, as I said this morning, we're at the end of the beginning, um, but now maybe the hard work starts. And up till now, there's been a lot of consensus. We've heard a lot of agreement on recommendations. Once we start digging into how we implement them, I'm sure that we will have different opinions. But I hope that we can use the very constructive 
um, uh, relationship that we've developed over the last two years to find a good way forward so that we're talking about bringing not just investment into the sector to transform the sector, but bringing new workers, young people into the sector, whilst also um, investing in and transforming uh, the jobs which exist in the sector today, because that would really be a just transition for the gas sector in Europe. It's very ambitious. It will demand all of us to play a very strong, proactive role. But um, the, the benefits long term will be really considerable uh, for workers, for companies in the sector and for the European economy as a whole. So I hope that we're up to the task. We're keen to get going um, and maybe um, I'll stop there. But just with one last word, there are three people in particular who this project wouldn't have happened without. I think it would be really remiss to not say thank you uh, to Sophie, Bronner, Jakob, who have dedicated an awful lot of time together with the colleagues from Syndex uh, to getting us to where we are. So um, from uh, personally from my side, but also uh, from industrial Europe, um, we're ready to now pick up the baton of this project. Let's take it to the next level. Let's give them a round of applause. Judith, thank you very much. Matthew, would you like to give us your thoughts and conclusions at the end of the day? Yeah, um, I, to follow that, really, I think, um, for me, the greatest obstacle to decarbonising um, the, the, the European economy isn't necessarily resources, it will be people. And uh, if, you, if you look at this room uh, today and uh, now and then compare it to how it was this morning at 10 o'clock. That sort of represents uh, the dwindling workforce over the last <laughs> 10 years. Um, the reality is that in, in, in some parts of uh, Europe, in the UK, for instance, over 40% of the workforce in the gas industry is over 50. So um, it's not just that we don't have enough workers today, it's that the demographics are quite markedly working against us. And uh, so one of the things in, in the report, which I do think we need to do, uh, put some more, more thought into is how do we make the sector attractive uh, as a destination for choice for people who are leaving, leaving school because if we don't do that we're going to really run out of room in terms of having, having workers who can sort of uh, play their part and that's quite, quite crucial because um, they will only come into an industry where they perceive themselves to have a future and where they perceive themselves to have good prospects, good employment prospects, good conditions and good industrial relations uh, where they exist. So we need good employers and we need unions, social partners who are, who are happy and content to, to, to promote that and to push that. But the other thing is the gas sector is not the only sector, of course, has been referenced that's, that's facing this. Every sector is facing that. We did a project in the electricity uh, sector pre-COVID and one of, the consequent, one of the outcomes there was that the sector needed to do more to, to promote itself. And that's a sector that um, has for many years um, sort of put the green lapel on and, and promoted itself. Um, and I think one of the, one of the um, great advantages of having these sorts of um, projects is that it refocuses us um, sort of to those challenges and allows us to take stock of where we need to be, uh, not just today, but looking further ahead and how we put all the um, the, the cards together to, to, to make it happen. So it's so we so we, we need to have a platform that is an attractive destination for people, and that we don't run out of we don't run out of workers. But then we, what we do have and is, is another challenge is we have workers sometimes in the wrong place, um, and so we've got to, this is where um, just transition uh, is most critical, uh, particularly in the, it will be in the gas sector where there'll be plenty of work but the workers won't necessarily be in the right, always in the right places. It's only in some areas where that's a particular challenge. And that's where we do need to work very hard, you know, work closely together to make seamless transitions, whether it be through technical skill training or whether it be through re relocation uh, and the ability to relocate. And I think if, we, if, if, the, if the industry is able to get that, get that right, um, that will unlock uh, the potential because more people will look in and see how well 
that transition has gone and therefore this is an industry, this is an area that is right at the forefront of um, social change and environmental change and it's a place that I want to be and be proud to work, work in. I think a lot of people are standing on the sidelines looking in. What we're doing here, which is the positive thing, is we're actually starting to get our hands dirty and trying to work out not just the problems but how we solve them. So I think that's really good uh, and, and a positive place to be today. Matthew, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, James, final word mm -hmm. from you. Um, you. Today, you've been described, the industry has been described as in the eye of a storm and at the crossroads. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Those are very interesting places to be, aren't they? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think that in all honesty, I think I would, I would pick up a little bit on what, what, you, what you'd said, because I think, indeed, sometimes we are cast as this sunset industry. I think that that is not the case. And it doesn't have to be a belief because actually there are reports like the one that Syndex do that show that there is a very clear pathway for this sector to go forward. I also would build on what Gabrielle from Total Energy said. When you're talking about how you reskill and retrain people, in our sector it will not always be to continue working with gaseous fuels. It may also be to work with electrons. That is an option and that is an opportunity that will also be there to, to take. So yes, it is a crossroads, because there are the decarbonized gases, the renewable gases that we have, but there will also be the opportunities that will be driven also by the increase in electricity. And our workforce is skilled and can be reskilled and repurposed. So our sector should not be seen as a dead end, as a cul-de-sac. In fact, quite the opposite. Crossroads don't actually necessarily mean that there's the end of the road. It means that you are just going perhaps in a different direction from the one you came in. That's probably not a bad thing also for a sector. We just have to make sure that you manage that correctly. Uh, I think the recommendations that came out, in, indeed, Jude, I don't think that uh, there's anybody who's going to really argue with them, and I would agree with Broner on that one as well. I think in, in your regards, we haven't approved the report yet, but I find it very hard to imagine that people won't see the value uh, that is being represented there but also because it lays out the further work that we need to do, those, those missing pieces of information, as you, you mentioned, Jude. They are there, and we have to find them. We have to work also on the best practices. It's not just Total Energies or Engie or others. There are many organizations who are doing things that we don't yet know. So we will have to work more on finding the right information, the right data sets, and building a better understanding of what is being done, how that best practice, rather than being a pat on the back, I agree, how that can be transferred across all of the members of Eurogas, across the sector. And I always think when we talk about sector in the end, we're talking about people. There isn't a gas sector, it's gas people. There is no gas without people. So we have to think first and foremost about the people that are working and are delivering. As whether you're an employee or an employer, it doesn't matter, you are all together and you're bound together. So when we're thinking about this, we have to think about it as gas people. What is their way forward? How are we going to provide the best for them? And how are we going to train them and skill them and identify the best ways to do that, even if it means crossing from molecules into electrons? This is the world that we are going to inhabit. I would also pick up on what Matthew said. It is beyond doubt that the future of the industry will be very different. It will be decentralized. If you go from uh, somebody who is producing uh, gas on a rig today, it's going to be very different in the future if they're producing biomethane on land somewhere. The methane is the same, the gas is the same, the means of production are entirely different, new skills will be needed. It is more decentralized. That also has an implication for communities, and we need to start planning now. Most of you have been to enough of these to have heard me bag on about my Welsh roots and the danger of getting things wrong. Jude has lived through it as well in the north of England. If you do not plan correctly for a transition, as we experienced in Wales, from coal and steel to nothing, you end up with nothing. In my hometown, of my year that left school, there's only one of my friends of about 20 that lives there. We all emigrated. That's the risk that you face. If you don't get this right, if we don't get the just transition correct, communities will be lost. So we have to work out how to relocalize. We have to accept that there will be changes in the future. And I do believe that doing work like we do with Syndex helps us prepare better than if we blindly stumble into the future. Let us think properly about what a just transition means in the gas sector and let us work together to make sure that we're able to deliver it for the people, the people of the gas sector. That's what this sector is. This is definitely not the end, mm -hmm. having a conference today with a final report. This is the beginning. We are going to use the information that we have. It probably will become more tough as we go on, but we have built a good basis and trust between the organizations. Mm -hmm. 
because we've been able to do this. Yes, a European framework agreement is much more stressful also for my members. What does it mean that they will have to sign up to? Very good. Let us open, be open-minded, clear conscience, and do what we can to try and achieve it. We have a spirit of cooperation. We have a community. Let's work together to get things done. Thanks very much. And I, before, before we actually do that, I want to say thank you to Sasha. Great moderation today. Thanks to all of you. And uh, thanks, of course, uh, most of all, to the teams who have been mentioned, but also to the great cooperation we've enjoyed over the last four years with Industrial and EPSU. And let's uh, continue that. Long may it continue. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I know there's been an awful lot that we've got through today. I hope we have left you this afternoon with lots of thoughts, opinions, ideas, and most importantly, um, ways to go and tackle this. And as I have heard so many times, and it's so right, this is not the end. This is just the beginning. So my thanks to the organisers, to our amazing interpreters, and uh, to you for giving us your time today. Thank you very much. Have a lovely rest of your afternoon. Thank you. I'm, I'm struck by the fact that I also...